All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started. I've got 1232, so we might still have a few more people jumping on. Um, so uh, depending where you are, good morning or good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's webinar featuring National Review Institute fellow Andy McCarthy and Rick Essenberg, president and founder of the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty. Today, we will be discussing the very timely topic of what are the real threats to democracy. My name is Margaret Ferris. I'm the Regional Development Lead here at National Review Institute with you from Tallahassee, Florida. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping and programming notes to keep in mind. Please note today's webinar is being recorded. And due to the number of people on the call, you are muted. That said, we want you to be engaged. Please feel, please feel free to use the chat feature if you have questions or comments for our panelists. A reminder that National Review Institute's in the midst of our regional seminar series entitled Foundations of Freedom, the Importance of Our Constitutional Pillars. We'll be in Chicago on April 11th with former VP Mike Pence and former Attorney General Michael Mukasey, as well as the renowned Andy McCarthy, who is on this call. So there's reason enough to attend if you're in the <laughs> Chicago area or Wisconsin. Um, for those on the West Coast, we will be in Newport Beach on April 30th and Silicon Valley on May 1st with John Yu and others to wrap up the series. So if you are in, in or near either of those cities, please be, feel free to join us and go on the NRA web, website and register. So we love partnering with our friends and today is no exception. Uh, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, which is a mouthful, so we will refer to it as Will, is a nonprofit conservative law firm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Will participates in court cases it believes will uphold the rule of law, individual liberty, constitutional government, or civil society. I looked on their website. They have an impressive track record of winning a large majority of their cases they undertake. In addition to its litigation services, Will publishes research on education in the states of Wisconsin and argues on behalf of its physicians on its website and in other public forums, including the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, National Review, the Washington Examiner, and dozens more. So National Review Institute is a nonprofit journalistic think tank founded in 1991 by William F. Buckley Jr. to not only promote and preserve his legacy, but to support the mission and writers of National Review and to advance the principles of a free society through educational outreach and programming, such as the webinar that you're on today. So next, a quick introduction of our speakers. Annie McCarthy is a best-selling author, a contributing editor at National Review, a Fox News contributor, and a senior fellow at National Review Institute. He formerly served as an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York, where he led the 1995 terrorism prosecution against Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and 11 others. Andy is the co-host, along with National Review Editor-in-Chief Rich Lowry of the McCarthy Report, a podcast produced by National Review, available on your favorite streaming services, download today. Little plug for, for Andy there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy provides analysis and commentary on national security, radical Islam, law, politics, and the culture. He worked, uh, his work regularly appears in National Review as well as other publications. Last but not least, Rick Essenberg. He is the founder and current president and general counsel of the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, or WILL, a rapidly expanding law and policy organization headquartered in Milwaukee. Under Rick's leadership, Will has grown into one of the more active state-based think tanks and litigation centers in the country. Rick is a frequent litigator in state and federal courts and a nationally recognized scholar and commentator on constitutional law, particularly the First Amendment's guarantees of freedom of speech and religion. We are really pleased today to have both of these distinguished gentlemen, and without further delay, I will turn it over to you. Well, I guess I'm starting. Um, it's, it is always a privilege to do anything um, with my friends at the National Review Institute. I think National Review um, has played a critical role in building American conservatism uh, into what it is today. And I, I think will continue to play an essential part of attempting to preserve and strengthen it. And, uh, and, and my introductory remarks are going to be a little bit about that. Um, um, I know Andy wants to talk about um, the resilience of our institutions. I think that that is um, um, a good framework to keep in mind as we uh, talk about some of these issues. Uh, and, and I know that he wants to talk a little bit about um, what happened on January 6th. And 
in, in my view, uh, we got through all of that uh, because of the nature of America's political institutions. Um, power is diffuse and the population has a long if imperfect history of respect for the rule of law and American norms. We have a commitment to live by the rules and abide by the outcomes that those rules produce. But there's a funny and uncomfortable catch to that commitment. Um, you have to be willing to accept defeat and move on. Uh, you're gonna lose elections. You have to accept that. Um, you are going to be unable uh, to pass your preferred policy outcomes. Uh, you're not gonna be able to win um, every um, court case. And uh, you can hate that, you can work to change that, but the trouble begins when you begin to think uh, that the next election, the latest bill, uh, the current court case um, is existential. And there's increasing evidence that many of us do, uh, the rhetoric that we hear. We, we're, we're told that in this election, democracy is, is on the ballot. Uh, fascism is around the corner. Uh, it's a flight 93 election, right? We have to do everything possible to win this election because, uh, you know, we, we may die in the attempt, but we will almost certainly die if we fail. Uh, we hear that, you know, if uh, the next election comes out uh, wrong, we won't have a country any longer. Uh, we have a Supreme Court justice of the state of Wisconsin who says that democracy is hanging by a thread. Um, this is really extreme um, rhetoric. And it, while it's not unprecedented, uh, it seems to be increasing. And uh, it creates um, enormous pressure uh, to... Um, not to abide by the rules, to work around the rules, because um, if the very existence of the nation is at stake, then uh, procedural regularity and commitment to the rule of law uh, seems to be, to many people, a luxury that we can't afford. And so the result of that, I think, is that um, both sides of the political aisle are increasingly becoming a liberal. And, and by liberal, of course, I mean classical liberal and the commitment to the rule of law, constitutionally limited government, individual rights, including rights of property, freedom of speech, religion, due process. Uh, and uh, that is reflected in some of the rhetoric we see. Well, on, on the left, you know, speech becomes violence, law becomes an obstruction. If we can't get something through the legislature, it's because the legislature is illegitimate in some way because it has been gerrymandered or the Senate shouldn't be organized the way that it is. And we hear it on the right too, increasingly. Uh, and, and, and for me, it's encapsulated in this phrase, which I have come to loathe. And that is uh, when my, my fellow conservatives and friends on the right tell me that uh, you can't be concerned about uh, uh, process, you can't be concerned about following the law uh, because you have to know what time it is, as if they're channeling the Chambers brothers from the late 60s. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think that and I think that reference to the late 60s is not in inapt because the result of this is that no one is an institutionalist anymore. Everybody feels that their job is to be a disruptor and a dismantler. Uh, and so the consequence of this is elites on the left have lost faith in, their, in our institutions. They believe that they're irreparably flawed in need of transformation. And as they have some success in transforming them, those of us on the right uh, are sorely tempted to regard these institutions as beyond recovery. And so the result of that is that uh, concerns about due process, individual rights, uh, uh, separation of powers, limits on government, uh, government institutions that um, uh, tend to force compromise and consensus. Um, all of that is increasingly seen as a roadblocks that must be destroyed uh, rather than guardrails uh, to guide us. And that manifests itself in many, many different ways. But I think therein lie the real threats to democracy. Well, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Rick, and I, I want to start out just by saying I, I 
always enjoy doing these seminars, but I particularly enjoy doing them uh, with Rick, who uh, and Will as well, but Rick in particular, who has uh, you know both feet uh, firmly on the ground. Which, by the way, that's that's becoming a uh, less and less a feature of our uh, politics. Uh, but also, he's you know I'm I'm sort of a a uh, retired lawyer for a long time and. Uh, I, I find that the further remote I get for it uh, from it, the easier everything seems to be. And it's always good to have somebody uh, who's uh, in the arena uh, fighting these battles in the in the real world to um, to, to bring back your sense of reality. I, I also think what Rick said about the existentialist mindset, I do want to talk a little bit about uh the capital riot stuff and the resilience of the system. But when, when Rick was talking about the existentialist mindset, it, it reminded me of something that I was uh, involved in a, uh, a program yesterday uh, with respect to, and that is the, um, the situation where the courts, the Supreme court and the 11th circuit in particular are batting back and forth the uh, you know, what to do about the, order, uh, and in particular, what to do about this lawsuit where the Biden administration has sued the state of Texas over its attempts to enforce federal statutory law within Texas and uh, to be able to uh, detain people who don't have a right to be uh, legally present in, uh, in Texas. And the reason it's worth talking about, I think, is what consumed the discussion I was involved in was what seems like a very small matter, which is the courts are batting back and forth this idea of what's an administrative stay, what's a preliminary injunction, what are the standards for imposing one as opposed to the other? At what point in time does an administrative stay become a preliminary uh, injunction? Uh, and that sort of thing. And it seems very far removed from a chaotic and crisis situation on the border, which is profound enough that I think it, it makes sense, even, no matter how you come out on this question, to be to be arguing about whether there's actually, in fact, an invasion for purposes of uh the, the constitutional provision that allows the states to take action, even in the absence of, of, uh, of federal action. So on the one hand, you have a very real and threatening problem on the border, which is starting to have real consequences in cities across the United States as communities are overwhelmed in their ability to provide all the services that legally they're supposed to be providing uh, to people who are in their territory. And that's something that people are now feeling throughout the country every day. And then you have the courts having this kind of, uh, you know, kind of academic hair splitting discussion about at what point preliminary preliminarily should courts jump into a controversy like this. And it occurs to me that the reason for that, the reason for that disconnect is exactly what Rick is talking about, which is that if you're if you're in this existentialist mindset, the the institutions that we need to deal with problems can't deal with them because the state they've so artificially inflated the stakes and so turned it into tribal combat that the assumption of our system, which is that we can have a pluralistic society that can that can it, not that they don't argue their side, but they can get to the point of compromising and moving forward. And then we, you know, if you get wrong, if if uh, you come out on the wrong end of that, we have the next election. We try to fix it. That's the way the system's supposed to work. And we don't have that right now. We have um, the the big issue in in this immigration dispute is actually one that goes to the core idea of. Uh, of the way the United States was founded, which is that we have a federal government and state governments that share sovereignty. And that's what the dispute is. What should Texas be allowed to do in defense of itself? But we can't get Congress and we can't get 
the the institutions, the political institutions of government that are supposed to deal with these crises to work. And the only system that seems to work is the court system. And yet the court system is not going to deal with the main thrust of these problems. It has to go through its um, uh, its procedural questions that have to be raised before you can, you can decide whether a court can intervene or not. So now we're, we've gotten to the point where we have tremendous problems in this country and the system that we've always relied on for dealing with them has broken down because we have infected our politics with this idea that uh you know every single issue has to be fought like the last war like the last war ever um and i just think you know we it's a disaster for us if uh if that's the way we're going to be going forward and again it doesn't have to be that way i think that um the worst thing i hear you know, Rick mentioned the uh, Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin who um, uh, who talks about democracy hanging by a thread. A lot of the a lot of the kind of wild stuff that we're seeing, the abusive stuff we're seeing uh, from government entities, is precisely fueled by this idea that democracy's hanging by a thread, and therefore we have to do, you know, outrageous things that we wouldn't otherwise do in normal times because. Um, we're about to lose everything. And I just think that a lot of this comes out of the experience of the Capitol riot and the way that it's been rendered uh, in the in the media and in political commentary. And that is just so overblown if you think about what really happened on January 6th. Did, did uh, former President Trump want to stage something like a coup where he was going to stay in power? Sure, he wanted to. But what we should come away from the day realizing is that nobody has the power to do that in the United States. It wasn't possible for the federal government or somebody in the federal government uh, to control how the elections came out. Uh, in this country, we have elections in at the state level. We have 50 state le elections. We don't have a, a federal election. We don't have any one official who was in the position to change the result of the election. And it was way beyond the power of people uh, who were around Trump who wanted to, to make that happen. There was never a chance that the military was going to get involved uh, in Trump's machinations. And no one knew that better than Trump, who didn't even try to uh, import them into that. Um, and I, I just think that all this uh, all this rhetoric about how our institutions uh, that we've relied on from the beginning of, uh, of constitutional governance, that they were uh, on the verge of collapse, is just patent nonsense. Uh, there was never a chance that uh, uh, that Joe Biden was not going to be ratified as president in the joint session of Congress. Indeed, the joint session of Congress took place the very day of the riot. There was a delay of a few hours, but it's not like um, uh, it, it's not like that there was ever a crisis that that it was possible that Biden wasn't going to be uh, wasn't going to be recognized as the next president. And the thing that I most uh, the thing that most galls me about the uh, the arguments we've had is this business about what if Trump decided to to stay in power? You know, in our system, his term ended at on at noon on January twentieth. Um, we don't rely on the goodness of people uh, to do the right thing and to do the things that the the law requires them to do. Our constitutional system takes care of that. He wouldn't have been the president one moment after uh, the inauguration of the of the next president. So I, I just think that we have a lot of um, I, I just think that the Constitution was the hero of the day on January 6th. And we ought to take some comfort from the fact that it proved itself to be as strong as it did, uh, and that sometimes, despite ourselves, uh, the genius of what the founders gave us uh, is very strong and should give us a lot of comfort about our system, even when things are a mess, and they're undoubtedly a mess today. So 
let me leave it at that. And I guess uh, Rick and I are going to bounce some things back and forth, right? So uh, well, what I, let me ask, Rick, I, uh, let me ask you uh, just to get us rolling. Um, there's been a lot of reporting uh, and media coverage about the change in the Wisconsin Supreme Court in the last several months uh, and how the constitu how the uh, the personnel uh, change in the court uh, may affect things like uh, voting rights and and uh, and several other big issues that are ongoing in Wisconsin. Uh, would you speak to that? Because I think a lot of people know that there is a uh, controversy, but they're not um, they're not as up to speed on exactly what the nuts and bolts of it is. Sure. So so we have had a, a series of hotly contested Supreme Court elections. Um, I don't think I'm being unfair when I say that uh, the although the elections are formally nonpartisan, um, the candidate who is clearly the Democrat or left of center candidate, um, they, they've started to run um, unusual campaigns in which they are uh, talking much more politically and much more outcome oriented than candidates in judicial elections have traditionally uh, conducted themselves, right? I mean, there's the old saying that, you know, a judicial election was like playing a game of checkers by mail. I mean, they're very, very boring. And, and, uh, uh, but, and, and in the last election, when the, the sort of the balance of the power of the court was um, up for grabs, um, the ultimately successful left to center candidate, um, uh, expressed her views, she called them her values, with respect to um, a number of contested legal issues. Like she said that the legislative maps in Wisconsin, uh, which had just been approved by the state Supreme Court, uh, had been uh, rigged in favor of the Republicans. She expressed her view with respect to uh, the right to choose to have an abortion. And uh, none of this, what we normally see in U.S. Supreme Court confirmation hearings where, you know, the candidate is hell-bent to say nothing about anything. So uh, we didn't have that. So the composition of the court uh, shifted. There were some administrative things that happened, which were somewhat startling. Uh, but uh, there followed um, a series of cases which sought to overturn things that had just been decided. And so um, I mentioned uh, uh, a case that uh, in 2020, uh, 2022, I did a case uh, approving uh, new legislative maps following the 2020 census. Uh, in the fall of 2023, a new case was brought uh, seeking to um, essentially overrule the earlier one. And without getting into all the ins and outs and uh, the complexities of it, um, that's sort of precisely what happened. It became quite clear um, after oral argument uh, that, the, that the court was, uh, and a, uh, an intermediate decision that the, that the court was going to overrule these maps. Uh, it was gonna throw these old, these maps that had just been approved out. And they were going to draw a new one. And it also seemed that the, guiding principle that they would use was going to be what they called um, political fairness. And for political fairness for them meant that the composition of the legislature should uh, not depart too significantly from the statewide vote for partisan candidates. So if the you know if the Democrats are getting 51% in the race for governor or the race for senator, then they should have 51% of the of the uh, legislature, legislative seats, or at least uh, relatively close to that. And if you think about it for a minute, that is an anti-constitutional position because we don't elect uh, legislators uh, by statewide partisan vote. There's democracies that do that, ours doesn't. We use these geographic districts. And if voters of one party are more heavily concentrated than the voters of the other, as they are, uh, there will not be a correspondence. Uh, uh, there's, litiga there's litigation involving abortion. Uh, there's lit litigation that uh, seeks to overturn a case that uh, 
that we won uh, in 2022 on the use of drop boxes and uh, ballot harvesting. Uh, there was an attempt to uh, find after 31 years that Wisconsin's first in the nation school choice program, voucher program for students to attend private schools was uh, for odd reasons now unconstitutional. Uh, that was rejected, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, I think, has the unfortunate um, effect of undermining confidence in the court as neutral arbiters, because it now seems that uh, the only, that this is just a political institution and whichever side has more political power, um, they're simply going to do whatever they think uh, is in their uh, policy or partisan interest. And it's extremely unfortunate. Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, one of the things I think that um, is radically wrong uh, with the way America works or doesn't work today is something that didn't seem to me like it was a big issue when I was a young lawyer, which was uh, many of the states, and probably most of the states, have electoral judicial systems as well as uh, elected uh, law enforcement officials, particularly U.S. Uh, uh, state district attorneys and municipal uh, attorneys. And when I was when I was a young lawyer in New York, uh, when Bob Morgenthau, having been the U.S. attorney in New York for a very long time, became the Manhattan district attorney forever, uh, he was up for election every I think it was every four years he had to stand for election. Um, in those days, if you took a very un Morgenthau position, if you took the position that if you elect me, I'm going to use the powers of my office to go after our main political foe, that would have been seen as disqualifying. It would have been seen as so obviously disqualifying that nobody would have done it, even if they harbored uh, those kinds of uh, intentions. And yet, flash forward to, I think it was 2017, um, Letitia James, who is the current uh, Attorney General of New York State, campaigned for office, promising that if she was elected, she was going to make Donald Trump's life miserable. And that, uh, you know, they would figure out something to charge him with. And I just think that you know, again, in the not so distant past, that would have been a disqualifying position for somebody seeking an office like that to take. She won in a landslide. So it seems to me that, you know, we have a deeper cultural problem uh, than a problem in these legal systems. But what we're seeing, at least in the in the lawfare campaign involving Trump, is the the dark underbelly of what these electoral systems can be. Because you have you have a situation where not only the prosecutors but the judges are elected, and there is political pressure on them to come to particular outcomes. And I think as late as the early two thousands, we at least aspired. No matter again, no matter what we may have like privately, what what at least some people may have privately harbored in their deepest thoughts when we spoke publicly about courts and prosecutors, we expected courts to call balls and strikes uh, in a fair way. Um, we expect prosecutors to uphold the law without fear or favor. Um, when we vet them, at least in the federal system, which is an appointed system, we at least go through the exercise of having them appear before the Judiciary Committee in the Senate and commit that they won't use their powers in a political way. And you can argue that, uh, you know, that's all for show. Um, and that when they get these positions, they do politicize them. But ultimately, uh, I still think it's uh, it's an important thing that we and I <laughs> I think it's more and more important as you see more abusiveness at the uh, in these electoral systems. Uh, I, I think it is more and more important uh, that we do bring people in and get them to commit, uh, even if it's just verbally, uh, that they're not going to abuse their 
powers because the norms, at least in the, I find at least in the, uh, in the cities have changed. Um, people are now, and make what you will of it because these are low turnout elections. I, I appreciate that. Um, but we have people who are campaigning, promising to do things with their government authority that not too long ago, uh, such people wouldn't have been permitted to seek office and they're actually being elected. Yeah. I mean, I, we were joking before we started that I, 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 I told, uh, uh, Andy and the people at NRI that I was going to start out squishy. Uh, so I'm going to get a little less squishy uh, <laughs> because I think part of this is exacerbated in the judiciary by um, really the, the sort of the nature of the progressive legal project, which uh, kind of views the law as being like radically under, undetermined, underdetermined. And, and you can, you know, you can do all sorts of things to advance your policy interest. And you mentioned balls and strikes. And that was, of course, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, you know, famous remark he got vilified for during his uh, nomination hearing. And um, I remember the old story that, you know, there's, there's, there's three different kinds of judges, the one who may be overly formalist and unnuanced say, you know, I, uh, uh, I call. Uh, how do you they ask him? How do you call balls and strikes? And and uh, you know he he or she says I, I call them as they are. And uh, one who perhaps realizes a little bit more about the complexity of things says I call them as they see them. Uh, but the uh, left progressive judge says they're nothing until I call them. And <laughs> and I think that's that exacerbates the effect of the electoral system. Because they think it's okay what they're doing. Yeah, well, I think this goes to what you were saying before about this whole existentialist mindset. It becomes an excuse for doing uh, all manner of abusive things. One of the things I wrote about last uh, week, which I find this astonishing that it's not like the biggest story in the country. And it would be if it were anyone else other than Trump that was being subjected to this. But we have a, system, a situation where they've not only um, they're not only using the legal system in order to to sort of derail uh, his campaign. And I, I should preface this by saying I'm not a Trump supporter. Um, I'm just observing. I'm somebody who's concerned about the way the legal system is being used here. But you would not um, you would not in a situation where you were dealing with terrorists or hardened criminals have a situation where multiple prosecutors uh, indicted in a strategically timed way so that there would be the potential of four trials going on uh, in a very finite period of time uh, during one year and the uh, and the courts would let them get away with that they had a they had a proceeding in Florida in one of Trump's cases, about two weeks ago, where uh, that case is bogged down because of uh, what's known as SEPA litigation, the Classified Information Procedures Act. It makes it very hard to get a case to trial because when you're dealing with classified information, you have to litigate all of the admissibility issues prior to trial, and it allows for um, pretrial appeal. So it really slows up the works, even if you're trying, even if you have people who are actually trying to get the case to trial in a fairly prompt way. And it, it's it's derailed at the moment because they haven't got enough time to get through the classified information stuff in part, in large part, because Trump has other proceedings going on. So he was supposed to begin a trial in Manhattan, a criminal trial. Uh, it, on uh, actually, the trial was supposed to start this coming Monday. It's now been put off for at least three weeks. But the judge, in uh, what I think is kind of unusual scheduling, in my experience, is going to sit four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, taking Wednesdays off. I've seen judges sit four days a week that usually they take Friday off, but this judge wants to take uh, the day in the middle of the week. So the lawyers, the federal prosecutors down in Florida uh, said to the judge down there, well, that's great. They're taking Wednesdays off. They can all fly down here to Florida on Wednesdays and we can continue to go through the classified information um, 
uh, litigation that we have to go through. And the judge was just incredulous. So the prosecutors ended up saying, you know, look, this scheduling problem we have is the defendant's fault. It's Trump's fault. So she said, how is it Trump's fault? And the, the federal prosecutor said, well, he insists on having the same lawyers represent him in Florida and New York. And if he would only, you know, spend another several million dollars to retain separate lawyer legal teams in both places, then they could be doing the work. One team could be doing the work down in Florida while he's on trial up in New York, uh, and we wouldn't have this situation. And the judge, I, I mean, as someone who worked in the Justice Department for a long time, I, I find this incredible. But the judge had to explain to the federal prosecutors that Trump actually has a right to be present at the proceedings in Florida and that the problem isn't the separate, you know, the the uh, the insistent on using one legal team to do both cases. It's that these guys have have taken the same defendant and subjected him to multiple proceedings under circumstances where I think if these guys were reverting this, this is the progressive lawyer left. If they were reverting to their mindset of the early 2000s when they were lined up from like Fifth Avenue to Guantanamo Bay to contribute their services to Al Qaeda, everybody would recognize every single due process problem that is arising out, out of this uh, array of different prosecutions. But it seems to be that because it's Trump, um, this is something that isn't getting getting any attention. But I, I Frank, I cannot believe that the courts are allowing one person to be whipsawed in four different jurisdictions, hundreds of miles apart, uh, under circumstances where they're trying to. Basically, it's it's perfectly obvious that they are inappropriately using the campaign calendar uh, as the the. Uh, as as the thing that is controlling the scheduling of these proceedings. And I just think if it was anyone other than Trump, that would be a pretty scandalous thing. You know, you know Andy is one of my, is 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 my my first go-to guy when it comes to uh, law, lawfare in uh, the criminal uh, courts. And uh, and I, I heard you on a podcast recently. I don't know which one, one of the ones I listened to. And uh, I think you said something like, uh, the first rule of politics is what goes around comes around. And there is a sort of a stunning unwillingness to recognize this. There's no permanent victories in politics and you're going to lose the power that you have at some point. And there's also no unilateral disarmament. And so if this becomes part of the repertoire of political warfare, it's it's going to be used by both sides. It's not going to just be just for Trump. Yeah, actually, you should weigh in a little bit on that with respect to the filibuster, because I, you know, there's a very good chance that you could lose the filibuster in the Senate next year, because the two Democrats who have been the public holdouts against abandoning it, if you, I'm, I'm told that if you hold people quietly, that there's probably seven or eight other Democrats who don't want to let the, the filibuster go because they understand what it would do to that institution. But the two have who have been very public are, are uh, Manchin of West Virginia and Cinema of Arizona. And they, of course, are not seeking office again. So if uh, if Democrats prevail in those elections, you may have a majority, at least nominally, uh, to get rid of the filibuster. And I just it seems to me that it's along the lines, Rick, of what you were just talking about, which is the failure to recognize that what goes around comes around uh if they if they remove that and then try to basically slam their agenda through what's the next step yeah although i have to say i i, I wouldn't want them to get rid of the filibuster but i would like them to go back to the old jimmy stewart style filibuster yes you got to yes. get up and read i mean if you want to do this you you got to want to do it. You got to read from the phone book. <laughs> yeah, no, I I I, I totally uh, agree with that. Although I I do worry, and this goes to what you raised in in, um, in your opening remarks, and it's a it's a theme that you've hit a couple of times. But what happens to the nature of the courts here? Because the first the the big thing that's driving the filibuster discussion, it seems to me, is 
the desire to change the Supreme Court because under the system that's in place, the, the court has uh, ideologically shifted. And I think basically the ideological shift of the court is as much driven by um, strategic miscalculations by, uh, by the, the people who've been bitten by the ideological shift as, as anything else. But the big push on filibuster and changing it is the idea that, I, and I think uh, uh, Congressman Schiff, who's running for the Senate in California, has as much as made this an express uh, position in his campaign. They He wants to have legislation which would create four more uh, seats on the Supreme Court, which would enable President Biden, if he were reelected, to name four new justices, which would instantly change the ideological composition of the court back to uh, something more like it was in the in the 1970s. And they seem to be heedless of the idea that, well, you know, they're not going to be in charge forever. So the next guys will come in and they'll put another four seats on the court. But I, I guess the idea is if you're if what's driving this is that they think the Supreme Court is coming out to the wrong outcomes, um, how is the Supreme Court a legal institution anymore if the if the idea is to change it so you have enough votes that your side wins rather than that they're going to enforce the law? Right. And 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 once you do that, uh, then, you know, the, the, the role of the courts as sort of this you know, bulwark supporting the rule of law, which is itself essential to democracy. I mean, you can't. You can't really have a democracy without a rule of law because the idea is that we, you know we elect people that make the law we and 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 then we respect that and we follow it because that law has the imprimatur of this democratic process. Well, if you're just going to change it willy nilly, depending upon you know who's got uh, who holds the balance of power on a um, uh, collegial court, I you've lost the rule of law. And 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 I don't think we're seeing it that way. I think you hear a lot of rhetoric that says, "Well, the Supreme Court should follow what we think the people want, uh, even if the people haven't ex expressed that will through the political process and you know the way that we make law in this country." And that's not seen as a threat to democracy, but it is a threat to democracy, a major one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think that's, I think that's right, and I, I, I say that as I've been very critical of um, what I take to be Chief Justice um, Roberts' propensity to weigh heavily the political pressures on the court, and you know it's easy for me to say because I'm not. Uh, the subject of uh, you know these filibuster discussions and the court packing discussions, and he's an institutionalist who worries that his his institutions are going to be ruined. So maybe if I was in his shoes, I'd be more sympathetic. But um, I, I've I think the court sometimes pulls up short of deciding the main issues in cases because it would like to project collegiality more than. It would like to have a five to four decision that, or six to three decision that broadcasts uh, what's what's perceived widely, and I think mostly correctly, to be the ideological divide on the court. Um, I'd hate to be wrong about that because I, I think we, our system, quite intentionally insulates the courts from politics because we don't want them putting a wet finger in the air and trying to read. Uh, you know, the public temper. We want them to decide cases on the law. And if the public doesn't like what the law is, after the courts made its best effort to say what the law is, then the public and the political branches can change the law. But um, if you're demanding certain outcomes out of the courts, then you're changing the nature of what the court is. And I think Roberts has tried to fight back on that by projecting that the court is not as ideologically divided as the media portrays it to be. And it seems to be that he's got some allies in that effort in uh, in Justice Kavanaugh and, and perhaps Justice Barrett as well. Who, uh, Barrett has publicly 
uh, been out there in recent weeks talking about that the that the court is not nearly as divided as um, as its reputation would have you believe. I, I'm really not comfortable with the court in that role, but at the same time, or, or I'm, I'm not comfortable with the court in this mindset of being worried about how it's perceived. But at the same time, I, when I look at the, especially the federal government, I don't see any other branch of the federal government um, at least trying to project that it's that it's uh, a an important uh, branch of government in a pluralistic system where you have to compromise and you know you move on to the next case. It's the branch that we don't we we try to remove from those kinds of pressures, and yet it's the only one that seems to be um, operating under that mindset. Yeah, I, it's you know, interesting. And, uh, Rick, I'm, I'm apologize. We have several questions that have come through the chat box, and sure. um, and and some of them actually pertain to what we're talking about. So I want to make sure we at least get to some of them since we've only got about um, 15 minutes left. Um, I'm going to try to go through these quickly so we can get to as many as we can. Although I'm, I'm not sure we can get to all of these, but I I will go into the order that they was they were received. Um, Joseph Elliott writes, and he has a follow-up, so I'll do both of these at once. I have very little faith that we will have fair elections in the fall, given the immigration situation and high likelihood of either fraudulent voting, mail voting with no identification of citizenship, vote harvesting, et cetera. What can be done or is being done to challenge illegal fraudulent voting in this election to prevent an outcome similar and likely worse than the 2020 election results, I fear violence? And then his follow-up is, and beyond that, if the appointment of elector electors' electoral votes is based upon state counts of illegal immigrants, does that not threaten democracy, at least based upon the current two-party system? Um, it's a loaded question. <laughs> we, um, we did a report at will on the 2020 election in Wisconsin. And uh, it... Um, uh, I think we did a pretty good job. The Wall Street Journal editorial board said it was the best uh, study of the 2020 election uh, that we've had so far. And we looked very, very hard uh, for evidence of fraud. And, and what we found was this. We found that it was almost certain that uh, the number of votes that had been cast improperly in a way that the law does not permit exceeded Biden's margin of victory. But that a vote was cast improperly doesn't mean that it was cast by uh, an, someone who is not eligible to vote or because it was uh, uh, made up or fabricated. And uh, we looked every which way. A report goes on for about a, almost 200 pages and we found no evidence that uh, that the outcome of the election was affected by the casting of these votes. That is, more eligible voters voted for Biden than voted for Trump. And you can't, you can never eliminate the impossibility of fraud. Uh, but I come away with two takes from that. First of all, it it is important to have um, election integrity uh, so that people will have. Um, uh, faith in the outcome. And if if what you do is you change the rules in the course of the game, uh, you know, you undermine that confidence, even if you haven't affected the outcome. Uh, second thing, and everybody that actually does this type of litigation, I think, whether they say it or not, agrees with me on this, is that fraud is very difficult to do at scale. And so, uh, yes, you could have outcome affecting fraud in a very, very close election, but it has to be very, very close. And a 20,000 vote margin in a state like Wisconsin, which is what we have, is probably beyond the margin of uh, uh, a fraud, just because in order to do it, you'd either have to involve so many people that somebody would talk, or you have, and, and you wouldn't, even if that didn't happen, you wouldn't be able to do it without creating obvious anomalies. And, uh, and and there just weren't those. Okay. 
Let's go on to the next one because we have several more. Kurt Weitzel, how much has this is good? How much has the legislative branch not taking their part in the three parts of government and the number of executive orders by the recent presidents sort of screwed up the current balance of democracy? Well, I I, I would say we wish we had Charlie here uh, for this one because Charlie's the uh, Char Charlie's the Article One guy. I think Charlie thinks that when the uh, Constitution was written, we should have like written article one and stopped. So um, there obviously has been a shift in the uh, in the balance of power between and among the branches of the government. I think that's an inevitable thing if you're going to have a metastasizing administrative state with the president kind of nominally uh, at the top of it, because a lot of the administrative agencies are executive agencies, Congress has simply delegated uh, an immense amount of its power, its lawmaking power, to the president under the auspices of emergencies. I think there are now, I can't remember what the exact number is, but I think there were over three dozen, maybe over four dozen provisions in federal law that allow the president to make to do what legislators would do, but on the uh, uh, on the fact that there's an emergency. Some of these emergencies are like the Korean War. I mean, they go back to like seventy years, and nobody's ever uh, nobody's ever changed them. And then the other thing is that they have delegated a bunch of their power to these administrative agencies, and the court um, has done more to cut back on that than uh, than Congress has. Congress seems it seems to me just continues to um, to arm these agencies with it just seems to be like I, I guess the best way to put it is that the job of somebody in Congress now seems to be to delegate your your legal authority to other operators and then go on cable television and complain how bad everything is. Um, the balance of power in the country is supposed to be that the Congress is the center of gravity uh, because and especially at the House level, they're the most responsive to the public. But it seems to me that they're the least responsive to the public. And the dysfunction is they can't deal with anything, even again, to repeat what I said before, when we have an illegal immigration crisis that is now uh, strangling the ability of city governments and some state governments around the country to deal with it. Uh, at will, our white whale is the anti-delegation rule. We had, it had one good year in the 30s. We can have another one someday. <laughs> someday. Not give up the faith. All right. Ben Cohen has got a question for both of you. We'll start with Andy. Oops, I just lost it. Let me see. Uh, for Andy, uh, what breaks the fever with the partisan divide we live in today? I, I, I don't know. I think there's too much... Um... I, I actually think it's the media. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, it, it's easier to go on these 24-7 um, news services, um, which don't do much news anymore. Uh, if you if you turn them on at night, they're, they're mainly, um, you know, red meat entertainment shows. They, they do a lot of decent uh, news reporting in the daytime, but at night... Um, you know, when the moon comes up, that's when I try to sign off. Um, and I, I just think that there's there's too much of that. Uh, and I don't see that receding. In fact, uh, I'd be interested to, to hear what Rick thinks about this. But what I always what we get a lot is, you know, we think we should have trials on television, too. And on the state level, you do get uh, some some states that broadcast their trials. And I, I just think um, that would be making a, a problem that's bad even worse because there's already too much performance and not enough uh, substance and all the pressure is in that direction. Yeah, we've turned politics into entertainment. I, I mean, I know people, th this is how they spend their evenings and uh, people like to be outraged. Uh, and uh, it, it allows them to uh, sort of assume this stance of virtue. And well, I don't think that. And uh, it's not it's not healthy. And I think the problem is that it's resulted in a situation where uh, 
it's not that the Overton window, like the range of acceptable policies has expanded. It's that it's it's split into two, right? And the Overton window for the Democrats doesn't overlap uh, as much as we might want it with the Overton window for Republicans. And so uh, this sort of contributes to the idea that we have to win elections, uh, we have to win this election, or America will be destroyed uh, because we'll empower AOC or we'll empower Marjorie Taylor Greene and, uh, uh, and the cable news networks cheerlead for all of us. Oh, there's just so many questions. There's just no way we're going to get to all these. We've only got a few more minutes. Uh, all right, I'm going to go on to Roman um, and Bueller, and this will be our last one because I feel like we've only got a few more minutes. Um, what are your thoughts on efforts by the left, including groups like the NEA, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, and League of Conservative Voters, too, if they win in 2024, pass a law, the Judiciary Act, to expand the size of the Supreme Court, I'm going to talk about this, in efforts backed by 200 members of Congress to enact a constitutional amendment, the Keep Nine Amendment, to preserve the current number of nine justices. How do you assess the fact that not a single Democrat now in Congress has so far supported Keep Nine, even though it was first introduced in Congress in 2020 by a Democrat? Well, I, you know, look, it's it, it's obvious that when the Keep Nine uh, got started, it was started for political reasons because of the uh, the composition of the court at the time. And as the composition of the court has shifted in an originalist, textualist direction, uh, the people who want to sort of make it up as they go along, the uh, organic constitution crowd, now decides that uh, nine such not such a magic number after all, uh, and we should have more. So the reason that that uh, keep nine uh, has not uh, has become unpopular where it first started is because the politics have changed. But the thing is what what Rick said before about the nature of the court hasn't changed. And if you do this kind of stuff, you turn the court into a super legislature. It's no longer, you know, we have courts because we need courts. You have we need to have one branch of the government that's insulated from politics and that is supposed to uh, not only consistently apply procedural law as well as substantive law, but is supposed to do it in a way that tunes out uh, the public noise and is and feels it can reach decisions that everybody knows will be unpopular. If you don't have that, we're not going to have America. Guys, we've only got about another minute left, so I'm going to let you each have maybe 30 seconds to give your closing remarks. And um, obviously, this was a hot topic, and we'll have to uh, continue this another time. But go ahead. Rick, we'll start with you. Uh, well, you know, I, mean, I think that um, I, I, I think what's important, and I think what, um, what, what I try to emphasize to the extent that I have to address this in my position is that um, the 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 basics of the American founding um, were legitimate? The, the 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 preference for consensus, the diffusion of power, uh, the respect for individual autonomy, uh, and uh, when I hear uh, from both the left and the right uh, attacks on our constitutional system. Um, I think it's important uh, for those of us who are more traditional fusionist conservatives um, to stand against that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I you know, gave the shout out for National Review, which is certainly has a divergence of opinions. Uh, but um, but I think that the role that uh, that uh, you all have played um, has been essential. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, to working with you and others to continue uh, uh, that those efforts in the future. Uh, amen. And um, just a, a, a real tip of the hat to the good work that Will does. Uh, and I, I think you guys that that report that Rick mentioned before on the 2020 election is it should have been essential reading for everyone after uh after all the controversy it was like a serious effort to try to wrestle with what was and was not wrong what was myth and what was real 
um, and it was a it was an excellent product, but not at all surprising given the source of it. Thank you. Well, terrific. My thanks to you both. Um, this was a, a great discussion. And obviously, again, to all of our participants, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but um, we appreciate everyone being here today and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.